everyone, my name is Jonathan Ong. Thank you so much for having me in your conference. Although I deeply regret not being able to be there in person, um, it is the middle of the semester um, here at UMass um, in Amherst. Um, and so um, teaching is ongoing, um, but I would still love to participate in all the discussions that you will have. I'm sure you will have lively discussions about um, how to fight fake news. I'm using um, creative and imaginative um, new policy, and I would love to hear from you. Um, I'm still participating um, via Twitter, and you can tweet at me at Jonathan underscore C underscore Ong. So uh, my presentation today is entitled Disinformation Producers as Ordinary Digital Workers Behind the Scenes of the Philippines Fake News Industry. So I'm sure you've heard of the term um, patient zero. So um, a Facebook executive and Claire Amador can tell you all about her. Um, so uh, Katie Harbath of Facebook um, coined the Philippines as um, patient zero in the fight against di uh, uh, digital disinformation. <clears throat> and this refers to how the Philippines is in track in the forefront of fake news innovations. So um, I will try to argue today that we need to understand fake news as an industry. We need to understand its players, its actors, um, the producers um, of fake news websites, of emotionally arousing headlines, of very um, uh, sophisticated and um, very well-oiled machines of campaigns, digital campaigns. Um, they're not exceptional individuals or products of exceptional villainy. Um, in fact, at the most basic, they're really a result of the complicity and collusion of ordinary creative workers, of people in advertising and public relations or even in, in the media um, who do consulting um, for, for, for politicians on the side. So this is a very lucrative industry, um, political consultancies, and particularly digital um, uh, campaigning um, for political clients. And it's only getting bigger. So this is what we've found out um, in our uh, research projects. And I'll tell you all about them. So um, folks might be familiar um, with um, the two reports that I have co-authored with some excellent colleagues on the topic. So you see here um, the report Architects of Network Disinformation. Um, this is co-authored with Jason Cabanas and it was released um, a year ago. And this is a deep dive um, into um, the disinformation industry. We interviewed campaigners. We interviewed um, social media celebrities, um, those we call influencers, as well as lower level fake account operators, the so-called trolls. And so um, this project was trying to understand um, who are the people behind fake news? Who operates fake news websites? Where do they come from? What were their prior jobs? And also, crucially, how do these folks sleep at night, right? So how do they justify doing this kind of work on a daily basis? Um, how do they justify this work to others and ultimately to themselves? So we were interested in themes of morality, but not in a very simplistic good versus evil frame, but we wanted to understand complicity and collusion. And, the, and it's an 82-page report um, that is available for free. Download at newtontechfordev.com. So a very new report came out just a month ago um, in the new Mandala website. And it's also for free download. And it's called um, Tracking Digital Disinformation in the 2019 Philippine Midterm Election. And this is co-authored with um, Australian scholars Ross Tapsell and Nicole Corato. So um, this one builds on insights and approaches from the previous project. So the Architects report was looking at the 2016 election. The Disinformation Tracker report looks at the 2019 election. Um, and I'll just be summarizing its key arguments. So the key findings of this new report are, so now um, 
compared to 2016 where we were caught flat-footed from by the imposter news websites right we were shocked to see um, the fake um, time.com website that is spelled like t1me.com right so this is what we call fake news in the past so those were new to the 2016 election um, Mocha Uson and all the mega influencers and bloggers were new um, actors in the 2016 campaign so in 2019 uh, we were saying that um, we weren't so much as surprised by fake news in the same way in 2016, but in spite of um, having a vocabulary to talk about fake news, in spite of fact-checking um, initiatives and partnerships with Facebook and fact-checkers such as Verifiles and Rappler and AFP, in spite of Facebook themselves being very dedicated and being very responsive about platform banning, um, networks of accounts for inauthentic behavior um, when we talked to campaigners in fact they were receiving more money more investment more politicians were coming to them um, for both the legitimate digital operations and also the underground operations so it's become more widespread um, and not just at the national level but also down to the local level so down to mayoral races, um, it gets more dirty online than ever before. And it's also cutting across political camps. It's not just the Duterte um, um, associated senators, for example, who are doing disinformation. It cuts across all political camps and they have their um, different techniques of seeding um, disinformation narratives. At the same time, we also observed a shift from those uh, mega, very famous level um, influencers or bloggers to more micro level actors. And this is an important shift that um, one consequence of that is that it, they become harder to trace. As fake news becomes more organic looking, more authentic looking, um, it gets harder to spot what is actually fake. Uh, um, between what is a real political expression. So um, I just want to summarize here some conceptual shifts that I invite us to think about um, in studying fake news and disinformation. So the first is um, an ethnographic approach that tries to interview workers that tries to understand how fake news operates as an industry and not just as a novelty of new technology or of this populist political moment, right? There's ways of explaining it in the present. So we argue um, in our two reports that it's important to think about it in terms of its ordinariness. It's actually part of campaign practice. Black propaganda, black ops, um, these are um, uh, entrenched in Philippine political culture. We just need to understand what is new about digital campaigning. So um, I bring in my own um, expertise as a communication and media professor here um, to think about um, political operations not just as a product of charismatic political leaders but as um, produced and enacted by economic incentives in industry practice so in media and communications we think about film or television not as just produced by an exceptional director um, the humanities will have their auteur theory right so um, these are um, ideas, products of exceptional individuals. But in uh, media studies, um, we think about productions as collaborative and also as products of competition. And so we want to understand fake, fake news as part of work hierarchies, as part of broader organizational structures. Um, and, and by doing this, we're able to identify loopholes in, in existing industry practice um, which can be exploited by the current political moment 
um, to enact certain political objectives. So the third conceptual shift that I invite us to take um, in this um, short talk is to think about ways of regulating fake news not as content. So fake news as content will emphasize censorship, will emphasize takedowns, will emphasize banning actors, banning particular kinds of speech that we consider or label as fake news. And this is a very fraught practice. Um, I also have done research on Thailand where this practice is being weaponized by the government itself to muffle the opposition. This is very concerning and I'm very worried that this um, kind of approach, censorship style of approach, which is also anti-democratic, will be the primary way in which we solve, try to solve fake news. Instead, um, what a media production perspective brings to the table is let's understand how campaigns work, the process of campaigning, the process of putting advertising online, the process of collaborating with influencers on Instagram and paying them to do political campaigns. How can we, instead of banning them or censoring them, create more transparency in the process? So that's what I want us to include. Um, to think about. So our um, report, um, Architects of Network Disinformation, um, suggests a new definition um, of studying disinformation, that it is actually the organized production of political deception that distributes labor to a hierarchy of digital workers. So it's actually um, a collaborative and a competitive um, team effort that has three particular features. Um, one is that um, this is very much entrenched in advertising and public relations. The people who lead digital campaigns for politicians have um, existing clients um, in the corporate world. So they also are the campaigners for soft drinks, for shampoo brands. And they transpose what they have learned from um, using hashtags for Coca-Cola to using hashtags for Villar, for example. Number two, um, no one is a full-time troll. So um, we found that trolling is actually a project-based and sideline jobs. So um, these are three-month to six-month projects um, which have very specific objectives and very specific deliver, uh, deliverables. And the deliverables are measured using advertising and public relations metrics of reach and engagement. So again, this is not exceptionally new, um, but these are entrenched in existing corporate marketing practice. Um, but having said all of that, um, political campaigning and, and fake news for, for politics is much more insidious, right? Because it is about seeding historical revisionist narratives. It is about creating divi uh, divisiveness between different kinds of political camps. Um, and people have, um, we've, we discovered, have very creative ways of justifying themselves. What we say is moral displacement. Um, where they argue that they're never um, the biggest villain in the story, that they're not trolls, and that somebody else is a bigger troll. Because there's no one person who is fully responsible for creating that um, misogynistic fake news headline. They can always say, oh, it's somebody else who executed that tweet. It's somebody else who took it um, way and uh, way um, beyond what was really intended um, from the initial strategy document. So I'll be going through this um, very quickly. These are the hierarchies of workers who are involved in campaigns. And this is the kind of campaign which are advertising and PR driven campaigns. There are different models of fake news production, um, which I don't have time for today. Um, this is the advertising and PR model, which is the most prevalent form of creating a digital campaigns for, for clients, particularly during elections. So at the top of the food chain here are um, 
advertising and PR strategists who are the chief architects of disinformation campaigns. So they, are, they recruit and lead entire disinformation teams. They assemble the right um, mix of individuals who can enact uh, particular political aims. They are the ones who in interface with political clients, as you can see in the infographic. So they manage the overall project budget. And coming from advertising and PR and having a portfolio of corporate brands, they lend legitimacy to, to Black Ops projects. They're able to say, well, look at my portfolio, having consulted for SMART um, or for GLOBE um, in the past, this is the kind of reach and engagement I can promise to you in your own campaign. They can manage up to, um, uh, we've heard figures of 2 million pesos for a three-month um, project, which sounds big, but is actually super cheap compared to um, a television advertising. So television ads could be 1 million pesos for a primetime ad. That's for one ad. So this is a three-month project that can really go deep into um, uh, communities and fan communities online. So they have a real um, value for money um, uh, hiring them for digital campaigns. Um, at the second level, um, they will um, mobilize uh, folks um, we call digital influencers, which is the term for like online celebrities, right? So on one hand, there are those key opinion leaders, these online celebrities who might be seen as celebrity endorsers. So think Mocha Uson or think Ethel Buba depending on which political camp you're uh, a part of, there are different kinds of influencers. There are also lower level influencers we call anonymous, digital influencers or micro level influencers. And they're less famous as those mega influencers such as Mocha or Ethel Buba. Um, but they are nevertheless important when they simultaneously tweet um, the same hashtag, they can um, artificially engineer um, and, and manipulate trending rankings on Twitter. So um, digital influencers are also hired by corporate brands. So again, it's very much in, entrenched in industry. So there's the phenomenon in the past five years of the emergence of many digital influencer agencies in the Philippines, many located in Manila, who act as intermediaries between corporate brands and these teams of influencers who have uh, millions of followers or several thousand followers on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, um, etc. Et um, eventually, they were also roped in for political campaigns. Um, this is from our 2019 um, project. What we found was a new innovation in 2019 is the shift from the mega influencers, those with millions of followers to micro or nano influencers, those with only tens of thousands or even 10,000 or less followers. And micro and nano influencers look more authentic, more organic, more real. Um, they look more innocent, um, but they are actually also roped in and enlisted for campaigns. And they evade regulation. So politicians will never claim that they had actually paid out micro and nano influencers. There, these could be parody accounts. Um, these could be like Malacanang events and catering services, a fake Miriam Santiago account. Um, pop culture accounts could be um, Senora Santibanez on Twitter. Third strap Instagrammers are those sexy celebrities on Instagram um, who will be posting shirtless uh, pictures of themselves and then at some point will be posting um, uh, campaign propaganda for politicians. And of course, hindi ito declared to Comedec as official campaign spends. And hindi din sila na to take down ng Facebook because mas micro um, yung operations nila. Hindi, hindi masyado halata na fake news yung sinacirculate nila. So at the um, lower level of the hierarchy are those we call community level fake account operators. And so their aim um, is not for millions of followers. In fact, their aim is mostly in the comment section. So they, they will be the first to comment on news articles um, which are favorable to politicians. Of course, they will express their fan 
their fandom for a politician that they are paid for, or they will also critique and troll politicians they are um, they are trying to target um, of the opposing camp. So the term that we use in our report is illusions of engagement. So important din sila because sila yung nag-share, sila yung nag-like. Um, therefore, nabuboost nila sa algorithm um, uh, yung mga posts ng mga influencers. Mas lalabas sa mga news feeds ng ibang tao um, kung, uh, kung nag-engage itong mga fake account operators. So they can be paid um, daily rates of 500 pesos or 1,000 pesos a day, depende kung nasa Manila pa sila or sa probinsya. Um, so, hindi lang ito actually advertising and PR-led. So, many fake account operators um, operate within politicians' own staff. So, we found it super common in the 2019 election where politicians um, demand and pressure their own staff who do legal work, legislative work. Um, but then they're saying, hey, it's campaign season. Um, you should do your best to help our candidate to win the election. Um, one innovation in 2019 that fake account operators um, were really um, operating at um, in a very insidious and malicious way are in close groups on Facebook. So Facebook close groups um, um, are actually real communities. We observed overseas Filipino worker groups. These are groups dedicated to, for example, nurses in London, nurses um, in Cambridge um, in the UK, um, or even like weird conspiracy theory uh, groups. For example, we infiltrated a Filipino flat earth close group on Facebook. So what happens in these groups is that these are organic discussions. These are people who are actually sharing a bond with each other and share life stories with each other. But at some point in the feed, there's always suspicious political propaganda being posted. And when we did um, some tracking of some of these accounts, the people who are posting some of these political propaganda are sometimes the moderators of these groups. Sometimes they're not the moderators, but they're participants. And they are linked to other sites related to politicians. And so, kahit organic community sila, itong mga close groups na ito, mad madali din sila ma-infiltrate ng mga fake account operators. Um, so, fake news is of course produced, right? They are produced by teams of workers, advertising strategists, influencers, fake account operators, but they also depend on the real fans. And actually, what we found is that um, the real fans take forward um, what is fake news, what was planned by these um, advertising strategies, and take them in very unpredictable ways. So um, the memes that um, influencers and fake account um, operators um, craft and create sometimes are taken forward by fans who are really expressing their real um, support for a politician, but also real vitriol, um, hate, and violence. And a lot of the kind of hate speech sometimes come from real fans themselves. Um, at the same time, so, uh, we argue that because uh, this is, these are project-based operations, um, it's also sometimes a thin line separating what is a paid producer and a real fan expression because I could have been paid three months ago um, to do this project, but then I'm not being paid right now, but I'm still a fan of that political client, if you, if you know what I mean. So um, summarizing um, from, our, from our 2019 research, Ito yung mga moral justifications and legal loopholes that we have heard when we talk to campaigners. So um, when campaigners um, um, uh, talk to us, they said, you know, Comelec would only issue guidelines, but they're not really laws. Recommendatory lang naman sila. So if Comelec told them to, um, they're now supposed to declare digital campaign spends, which is a good thing that Comelec did for 2019, some of the campaigners felt, oh, we don't need to actually follow this um, because um, these are just recommendations. These are just guidelines. Um, number two, um, campaigners say, you know, hindi naman namin na meet yung, politi uh, yung politician directly. Paminsan yung businessman backer lang ang nami meet namin. So, um, 
this for me highlights a loophole in um, campaign donation and campaign finance um, and, and also political consultancy. So what does it mean that political consultants can be enlisted um, to serve certain politicians but then there's no direct um, interface and that is going on. Um, there's a level of plausible deniability here that is very convenient. It shields both campaigners and from politicians um, to be truly um, accountable for the things that they create and the things and the expressions that they um, see um, in social media. So one lawyer that we um, interviewed said, you know, politicians are required to sign off on their TV, radio, and print ads. But why aren't they held responsible for the content of their digital spins? So this is one loophole. Again, if we understand the campaign practice and process itself, makikita natin na may mga loopholes na pwede na, pwedeng masolusyonan. So, um, so just some questions here. I would just want to end with questions and I would love to hear from, from policy experts who are um, much more um, knowledgeable about um, about the law and about um, and about industry practice. So the first question here is maybe we're tackling the problem a different um, uh, um, from a different angle. Maybe we should take uh, we should address the problem from a different angle rather than um, directly hold accountable politicians. What if we also directly hold accountable um, the industry and say that, you know, um, digital influencers, you guys should be declaring um, whether you are being paid by brands and therefore um, you should also be doing that. You should also be transparent about your engagements with politicians. So maybe um, the, the trail, um, the sequence of events, maybe it might need to begin with the industry itself. But the, the challenge here is the industry is not interested for self-regulation. Um, they're earning so much money from this. Um, they think that they're, um, that they're not, um, um, that they won't really be held liable for the things that they're doing. Um, and they think that they're um, invincible. So could we put more pressure on the industry um, to introduce more transparency and accountability mechanisms? Um, the second question is, what if cures are worse than the, than the disease? What if the actual solutions or, or laws that might be passed, such as um, Tito Soto's anti-fake news bill, which is modeled after Singapore's um, censorship style of, of bill, which gives government incredible powers of takedown, and in control of online speech. What if that's actually worse than the disease? So I think some of the Philippines' um, slowness when it comes to regulation comes from this, um, from our own history of valuing free speech. Um, we take after the, the U.S. and, and their own um, histories of and protections around free speech. Um, and that's why the word regulation is such a bad word, even to journalists. Um, so how can we go around this issue? Um, and the third um, issue is about fact checkers and platforms. How can they maintain credibility or how can they regain um, credibility? Um, there's new fact checking initiatives, but how can these fact checking initiatives also be transparent in themselves? Um, how can they um, be prevented from slipping into political partisanship? Um, in other countries such as India, fact checkers have become um, politically partisan, where fact checkers and media organizations say we're only going to fact check the other side. Do we want that? What are the risks around that? Um, what are the opportunities around that? Um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, thank you so much for, um, for listening.